Welcome to Science at FMNH, a podcast and video series that explores the behind the scenes science, collections, and research at Chicago's Field Museum. Well, anthropologists who study um, economies in, in ancient cultures or in modern cultures are really concerned about the different ways in which people kind of ascribe value. Uh, to objects, how they um, exchange uh, goods and services, uh, and the different ways in which um, they create systems of exchange. Uh, we have often wondered why even um, when you're looking at the way of life of Homo erectus in the plains of East Africa, that you are able to find stone tools uh, whose sources are found as far as 500 miles away. How did they get there? And the only means through which uh, they got there, we have to assume, have to be through trade, because people are not just going to walk all for 500 miles uh, to acquire a lot of these items that they actually need. Well, elemental analysis is a form of compositional analysis, which is looking at the composition of artifacts and objects and basically um, Examples of ancient trade, ancient trade goods, material items that moved through cultures and through between ha people's hands. So elemental analysis is um, the fact of determining the composition of material. So in a given material, let's say a metal, we are going to uh, determine the concentration of all uh, the different elements in this metal. So if it's a bronze, there will be copper, lead, tin, and other elements, we will be able to say how, many, how much of each element. Basically, we drill a very tiny hole. The hole will have a diameter ranging from 55 micrometer to a maximum of 100 micrometer. So it's, um, the diameter is like the diameter of your hair. So it's really, really small, and when we are done, we cannot see anything unless we use a microscope. And then there is the ICPMS, which is an instrument we use to measure the composition of the object we want to study. So we have a normal laser and um, you need to put the sample, the object, into a chamber. This chamber will limit the size of your object. So it's a, the chamber is a cylinder uh, that has a diameter of 6 cm and it's uh, 5 cm deep. So any object that will be bigger than that won't be able to fit into the chamber. If you want to uh, analyze a bigger object, you would have to cut a small piece of this object so as it can fit into the chamber. But being in a museum environment, we don't want to uh, cut anything. We don't want to do any damage on the object. So we acquired a second laser that was modified by uh, somebody called Richard Cox. He um, modified a laser so as instead of putting an object into the chamber, now we put the chamber on top of the object. And we can accommodate really large objects like pots and this way we don't have to uh, cut anything, damage anything. Uh, this um, laser for large object is quite unique, um, especially in a museum setting. Uh, and this is a really powerful tool because it allows us to take an object like a ceramic pot, for example, or um, a fine brooch pin made of copper and uh, characterize its composition and trace it back to um, the, manu the quarrying source or the original raw material from which it came. So in the ancient past, when we don't even have history to tell us about where people obtain their goods and, um, and th that were manufactured, we can actually look at the chemistry of the object because that object has chemical signatures, just like DNA does in some respects, that fingerprint that object and tell us where it came from, from when, what is it made, from what particular ore source or quarry did this, did this material come from. And that actually allows us then, knowing where an object was found in the archaeological record, and knowing where it was made, allows us to begin to trace back those ancient trade routes and the means from which it came from its source of manufacture to the final destination of its resting place. I think it's really important to understand trade and exchange networks and their variability in time and space because being part of social and economic networks is a fundamental characteristic of humans and our species over tens and hundreds of thousands of years. And humans have always been part of these networks and they are part of the networks that extend over multiple scales 
geographic scales uh, from communities to regions, even to larger networks. It's critical to understand the history uh, of these networks and how they have changed over time and how they vary from one cultural system to another.